everybody, Richard again here from Electric Classic Cars and on this week's episode we're going to update you on some of the builds that we got in the workshop starting with this lovely Aston Martin. So this is a little bit of a tricked out Aston Martin, not least because it's been converted to electric but there's some styling little changes that uh, the owner is doing on it as well. It's been put together by Cotswold Classics and they've done a cracking job of actually just putting uh, together the shell and doing the restoration on it and now it's with us we're in the final stages really of electrical fit up so the fabrication guys are finished we've got the battery boxes done front and aft uh, the motors in uh, we've got the heater box the cooling system essentially all the welding and fabrication is done coolant systems in and the electrical guys are now getting their teeth into it so they're running the high voltage cable obviously all the orange cables high voltage and the low voltage loom they're putting in now. So once they've done that and done all the cable management systems and figured out exactly where the cable's gonna go, out comes the boxes, off they go for powder coating, in go the batteries, and it'll be final fit up. So although it looks like it's quite a f distance off getting finished, it's actually on the final furlong really. So I think what we'll do is um, we'll get it up in the air and you can see some of the trick stuff that we've done underneath. So I mentioned before this is a little bit of a tricked out Aston Martin and not least because it's been converted to electric and this shot kind of explains some of that because it's got um, coilover adjustable suspension on it, um, we've put some Tesla brakes uh, front and aft and there's a reason why we've done that, not least because the original Aston Martin brakes were pretty rubbish but um, we'll come to that in a minute because it was kind of dictated by the fact that we had to go with Tesla brakes on the rear which will become apparent in a, in a second. Uh, we've also, because we've got Tesla um, Model 3 brakes all around on it, we've got the Tesla iBooster um, master cylinder up here, which is an electric version of a boosted brake system, which is a really neat solution. That uh, means you don't have to have a uh, vacuum, because obviously an engine normally creates a vacuum for a brake booster, but when you lose the engine, you've got to replace that with an electric vacuum booster and anybody that's converted cars out there knows they're a little bit noisy or can be if you choose the wrong one um, so we've got them with an eye booster which is great and then down here we've got the power steering pump we've got the air conditioning pump there so you know there's there's all sorts of tricked out stuff just in this little area alone but um, the main thing I want to show you on this is the rear so let's have a look at the rear so here in the rear what we've done is we've taken a Tesla Model 3 motor and subframe, including the whole suspension and brakes, and we've shoehorned it into the back of the Aston Martin. And uh, because it's got the brakes on the rear, we've got to match the brake sort of pressures when you put your foot on the brakes with the fronts, which is now where you can see we've gone with complete Tesla Model 3 brakes at the front and rear. Uh, and this just bolts in with four mounting points. So the whole uh, Tesla Model 3 subframe fits like a glove in here, it's fantastic. Um, and then obviously the guys have been busy doing the high voltage cabling down here with all the cable management uh, cable clamps down where the original prop shaft used to go and exhaust so yeah high voltage is done low voltage is definitely uh, nearly done um, and the coolant system is done so it's going to be one heck of an Aston Martin V8 EV8 let's call it EV8 uh, Aston Martin EV8 uh, when it's finished is going to be awesome now next in the workshop is the 1967 Maserati Ghibli. It's a beautiful looking car. I prefer these to the Jaguar E-Type if I'm honest. But this was in storage for decades before it came to us. So even though we're road testing it, as you can probably see by a bit of uh, road dirt on the side, we've encountered some mechanical issues is probably the best way to describe them. Things like the rear leaf springs were so badly corroded and one was cracked we've had to replace those. The synchros on the gearbox were not in the best of health, so that gearbox has come out to get rebuilt. Um, but I'm not going to dwell on this car too much because essentially we're going to do a full episode on this in the coming weeks. But just to give you a little bit of a sneak preview, you can have a look under the bonnet. Now, I think this car is my favourite in the workshop right now. It is a 1958 Porsche 356A. It's a 1600, not the 1300, the earlier 1300s. You can tell that not only because it's got the 1600 badge at the back, which is a giveaway, but those in the know will uh, see their tailpipes, the twin tailpipes in the overriders at the back, and that's a sure sign it's a 1600. But just look at it. It is 
stunning. I mean, it's been beautifully restored. It's right-hand drive as well, so super rare. But oh, I'm in love with this car. It, currently, it's still petrol. It's got the engine and the fuel, fuel tank in. It's, uh, it drives, and uh, I have driven it. it. It drives really nice as well. But the plan is to give it um, not too much power. We're going to probably net gain Hyper 9 in the rear to the gearbox. The customer wants to keep the gears, so the net gain Hyper 9 has about 6,000 RPM of power, which is nice. You can still use the gears, probably a lot less, but still use them. But I really want to show you this car, so come and have a look at the interior. As it's for an interior, it is lovely, isn't it, Tim? It's beautiful, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I mean, new carpets, the seats have been re-trimmed, but it's still got patina on the uh, steering wheel, which I love just to give it a bit of character. Um, Looks like somebody's drilled a hole at some point behind the dash here because they put a 100,000 kilometre badge in there, which kind of works. Um, but we're going to keep this looking all original. Um, the dials are just going to say different things. So instead of uh, RPM, it'll show... Um, actually, you know what? We probably will keep RPM for the electric motor in there. Speed will be the same. But over here, the oil temperature will then become the motor temperature and obviously the uh, fuel gauge will become the battery gauge but we'll keep the gauges all exactly the same and we'll just um, have a translator if you like that's sending the relevant information to, to make those dials work so interior wise it's going to remain exactly the same and in case you're wondering what this is down here this is how you turn the heating on Ever seen one of these before Tim? I'd never seen one before no so what it is it pulls the cable at the back, which then opens up the uh, flaps for the heat exchangers because it's air cooled, and it opens up these flaps to let the hot air through. So that's what that is. So we'll probably keep something similar to that, maybe get rid of the knob and just put a switch on the top for the heater. But uh, beautiful looking car, absolutely beautiful. Uh, radio and the speakers, just stunning car. Let's have a look in the boot and the engine bay. So, in here, you've essentially got the fuel tank, spare wheel and tool roll. Uh, so we're going to obviously take out the fuel tank, replace that with the front battery pack, and then in the engine bay, put a motor in there and another battery pack in the rear. Simple as that. So in the engine bay, beautiful engine it is, um, we're going to replace that with a Hyper 9, which is going to be nice and low down. And I was initially thinking, can we make this into a, a secondary luggage space? But... Looking at where um, the space is, I don't really want to put a battery pack in the rear seat area. So we're probably going to end up having the motor down there and a battery pack on top. So that essentially the rear battery pack is probably going to be about where my hand is there. Um, so I'll have rear battery pack there and the front one where the fuel tank went. Next in the workshop is a car that the guys are busy with at the moment, which is the Mercedes 190 SL. Fabrication wise, you're pretty much done. The front battery box is done. The rear battery box is done. The motor and gear reduction unit is in place. And that's obviously driving the, the prop. Got header tanks in here, heater systems, controller. Um, you've got your CAD designed cardboard, aided design uh, radiators at the front as well. But one feature which you won't be able to see that this car is having is a feature which was the first ever time we've played around with it, which is Vita X. So this is going to have CCS, uh, that's Combined Charging System, that's your Rapid Charging System, that supports V2X. Now, what is V2X? Well, it's Vehicle 2, Grid, Home or Load. And this car will be used then by the customer to be able to uh, power his home, if you like, or if the grid re requests that the you know, battery balances the grid etc or if you want to put a load on uh, to you know, like a 240 volt load you can run that off the car as well so this is going to be the first ever car we've done with CCS based Vito X so really exciting uh, because of that but from an aesthetics point of view this is going to be a beautiful looking car when finished and I think Tim you need to put a shot up here of what a, a Mercedes 190 SL looks like when it's finished because you can't quite see how elegant this looks and it's going to be stunning when it's finished. Next to the Mercedes 190 SL, we have the Jensen Interceptor. So click on this link above if you want to see an episode where we're taking out the engine and gearbox out of this and weighing it. Because I think you'll be shocked at how much weight we actually took out of this. It was 
pretty much the equivalent of a small car. It wasn't that far off your Lotus Elise, was it? That's right. It was a couple of kilos different from, uh, from, from my Lotus Elise. So mm. the same, pretty much the same weight as a small car. Which was quite shocking, the amount of weight that came out of this. So where are we with this? Essentially, we're waiting for the bits and pieces to arrive now for us to start the conversion. And the, the main headline item that we're waiting for is this pretty tricked out, longitudinally mounted Tesla drive uh, unit setup. So that's going to drive the rear prop and go into the rear axle. And that is going to essentially be where my feet are. So pretty much just waiting on parts with the Jensen interceptor. And that's this one. On to the next one. Now, next to the Jensen interceptor is the opposite end of the process because that's just getting started and this has just got finished. So this is a 1957 VW oval beetle and in here is our conversion kit. So click on the link above if you want to see the details on this conversion kit. But essentially in here we've got a, a Tesla small drive unit, the chargers in here, the charge socket, radiator, header tanks, etc. So this is all ready to go testing now. And uh, we'll probably do a full episode on this when we do the test drive in the future. So stay tuned for that one. Next in the workshop, I've sneaked one of my cars in. It's my 1969 VW Crew Cab. Now, why is this in the workshop? Well, we have horrible stuff called salt that goes on the road in the UK uh, in the wintertime, and that makes a horrible mess of the chassis and bodywork if you're not careful as far as rust is concerned. So I wanted to get it up there, just wash all that stuff off, re-underseal it as well, and just check there's no rust coming through, which there isn't. And also at the same time, we put our new motor cradle at the rear because I wanted to just check that our motor cradle also works in there as well. So we put a brand spanking new motor cradle in the rear as well. But apart from that, this is going to be coming off because I need to drive it home tomorrow. So underneath here, you can see the actual cradle. Now, um, here's the Tesla motor and the cradle bolts into the front transmission mount, which is kind of here and then also the engine mounts uh, right there and there. So the cradle just bolts into the original mounts and the Tesla motor hangs off it. So that's our new motor cradle, if you like, for the uh, VW buses. Now I'll do two of these in one here because this will be quite quick. On my right hand side, we've got a Mark III Mini, just a, uh, a knackered old shell for mock-up purposes. And we're just trialing a low power option for our mini kits which is that motor down there so that's what is going on here and on this side is probably anybody that follows the channel something you're very familiar with which is our race car project it's just getting completely stripped down now because it's off for powder coating soon and as soon as it comes back we'll start bolting everything on so if you want to follow this build we've got a full-on build um, diary if you like of this one on our channel so this is the race car project on to the next cars Next is the Ferrari Testarossa. So, where are we with this one? This is another one that we're doing a build series on, so you'll have to follow that on our YouTube channel if you want to see more details, so I can't dwell on this too much, because Tim will kill me. But in short, we have the front battery boxes in, the middle battery boxes are in, and as you can see, we're waiting for the main battery box and the motor to drop in, but can't do that until the lads have finished off things like this, which is the low voltage loom, and... More of it here and there's more of it behind me um, but yeah low voltage uh, needs to get finished off but apart from that we're very close to dropping the main battery box and the motor in so if you want to see an update on this we'll be doing an update on the testarossa to tesla rosa conversion very soon on our channel so stay tuned now before we go to the next car i've got to walk around these things here uh, now these are ferrari testarossa kits We've already got the motor uh, and cradle over there ready to go in that Ferrari Testarossa. But because we've got other Ferrari Testarossas to do and a kit that needs to go to the States, we've got one, two complete Ferrari Testarossa kits that are ready to go for powder coating. So that's what these are. But now, on to the next car, a Triumph Vitesse. Now, this is just freshly into the workshop and fresh out restoration as well. It's a Triumph Vitesse which I've got to admit, I don't know too much about 
Triumph Vitesse. Is a friend of mine had a Triumph Herald way back when. And I think the Triumph Vitesse has a six-cylinder engine. Triumph Herald had a four-cylinder engine. Tim That's is right. nodding. That's yep. right. Okay, I've got that one right. You're, you're the British car expert. You tell me one fun fact about the Triumph Vitesse, which I don't know. I don't know if it's a fun fact, but um, of course they're famous for the bonnet opening. So you've got really good access for for working on the engine. Right. And I think one of the other advantages from that is it get really, really good turning circle because the wheels can really turn. And on that note, um, for those that are wondering why are the wheels at such a weird angle, um, obviously there's no weight in the front. So as soon as the um, weight comes back onto the front, those wheels will, the camber, if you like, will go back to normal. Uh, Tim, do you want to pop around there and we can just open up the um, bonnet? So the whole of the front clip just goes forward. You got it? So we'll have a close-up of the engine bay area because it's been stunningly restored. So have a close look at that. We simply don't have time to do restorations ourselves now. Um, so anybody that brings us a car it has to be in fairly good nick or restored by an external party. And that's exactly what has happened in this case and it is probably one of the best restorations we've seen come in. Uh, I don't know who did this, I'll, I'll see if I can find out and put a link in the description of the video, but whoever did this needs a massive pat on the back because it is mightily impressively restored. So plan is with this one, we're gonna go with a Hyper 9 onto the original gearbox, and then somewhere in this area then we're gonna have a front battery pack and that's pretty much it in here, but I'm just stunned by how well this has been restored. It is absolutely spotless. Now again, here in the boot, you can see the quality of this restoration is just stunning. And we've got to figure out where we're going to put a rear battery box. We haven't really thought this car through yet because it's literally just come in this week. But somewhere in here, we're going to put a rear battery box uh, we're going to need access to that, so it's either going to have to go close up against the rear bulkhead or maybe over here and split over there. I haven't quite thought that through yet, but uh, I just love the wingtops. That 1970s British car, and we were still playing around with like finned wings like they did in America in the 1950s. Very cool car. Now, from beauty over there with the Triumph Test to the beast, we've got a Defender 110 pickup here. And this is quite a special project for us because essentially it's a demonstrator for BF Goodrich. So this has been built by Britpart, who are our neighbours. They are the world's largest aftermarket Land Rover parts supplier. And they're just over the road. So they built the vehicle, so they've got all their trick parts on it they've done the, the paint the restoration etc and there's some pretty trick parts on here you've got to get some close-ups of these tim because there's a, a terra firma um, front bumper and winch setup um, there's a really tricked out air suspension system and you're probably wondering what's this tank underneath here mogs have you gone hydrogen finally no that is not a hydrogen tank that's the air tank system for the airbags so we've got an airbag on each corner terra firma shocks down there as well and it's level sensing as well so it's got automatic level sensing there's a number of sensors on each uh, suspension arm if you like so that when you put a big massive load in the rear you know it's not going to sit down like that it'll automatically adjust the suspension accordingly and i think there's three modes as well you can have it low like medium or high for off-roading as well so really um, full of tricked out little parts on this, not least of which is my favourite and probably the smallest, which is a um, number plate light at the back, which has an integral reversing camera in, which is uh, I really like. I think I'll have to get that on my Land Rover. But yeah, this is going to be an absolute monster when it's finished. Um, we've dropped in our standard Tesla drivetrain conversion kit. So um, if you want to see more details on that, we've done an episode on our Land Rover conversion kit on our YouTube channel, so go and search that out. But essentially what it is, is you've got a Tesla drive unit in the middle, 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, so 60 kilowatt hours in the front and 40 kilowatt hours in the back. And yeah, I can't wait to see this at the shows because BF Goodrich are gonna be taking this to a number of events this year and ongoing. And I think it's just gonna be an absolute stunner of a Land Rover when it's finished. Now next to the Beast, is this beautiful Porsche 912. 
So this was the baby brother, if you like, of the Porsche 911, because essentially it's all exactly the same, apart from the fact it had a pretty asthmatic four-cylinder engine in the rear. But it's a uh, pre-impact bumper one, which is uh, pre-1973. Beautiful color, fantastically restored as well. Uh, I'll put a, uh, a link in the description as to who did the restoration on this. Uh, tan interior, which is beautiful. The guys have already um, started offering up our standard 911 bolt-in conversion kit. Again, it's one of those bolt-in conversion kits that we already have available in stock and uh, off the shelf, if you like. Done a number of 911s. Um, the only difference is the mounting points in the rear, uh, where the engine mounting points are, if you like, are slightly different on a 912 compared to a 911, because obviously the engine is shorter, so therefore the engine mounts are a little bit uh, further forward. So just done a little bit of a tweak on our standard 911 bolt-in system, which is now supports 912 as well. So uh, if I open up the front, let's have a look how far they've got. Okay, let's have a look what we've got in here. So we've got the front battery box, which is kind of placed in there. It's not mounted in there yet, as you can see. Uh, when it's properly mounted in, this will drop another three or so inches. So it'll have a decent amount of luggage space, to be fair in this. But total battery pack is going to be 70 kilowatt hours. And there's an exact copy of this in the rear. So actually, this is the, the total battery pack is split 50-50 between the front and the rear. Now we do that for two reasons or benefits if you like. Number one is weight distribution. So obviously there's a, a big benefit of moving a little bit more weight up front in a 911 or 912 because usually in these cars um, most of the weight is in the rear which handling wise wasn't ideal let's say. So moving a little bit more weight up front is a good idea. So we've got um, number one reason weight distribution. Number two is ease of manufacturing. So the fabrication department over at the other end of the factory when they're making these essentially just has one design. So this battery pack or battery box looks exactly the same as the rear one apart from the mounting feet which they're in the middle of doing now. So that's the front. Let's have a look at the rear. So here in the rear of the Porsche 912e we have a very familiar looking battery box because it's the same as the front one and we also have the header tank because underneath we have a Tesla small drive unit, not the large, and that'll be plenty enough power to push this car along. So that's the header tank for the coolant system for the motor and inverter. And then on top here, this is a polished aluminium cover for the charger. So it's essentially it really. I mean, we've got uh, a cradle underneath which attaches to the gearbox uh, uh, mount at the front, the engine mounts here which as I say on 912 are further forward than a 911 and the whole of the battery box and motor all bolt onto that cradle. So a real simple bolting conversion kit. Now it's the last two cars in the workshop. The f second Ferrari test roster we've got to do and another Land Rover Defender. I'm not gonna cover these in detail because essentially there's no difference really in this Ferrari Testarossa than the one that we covered earlier, apart from the fact that this is waiting for that one to get finished so we can test it, make sure all is good, and then if all is good, drop that conversion kit into this one. And then the Land Rover Defender, fantastic example of a 110 Defender. It's uh, originally from South Africa. I can't believe how pristine the chassis is on that one. It's pretty amazing. It looks like it's fresh from the factory, but that's just a, another Land Rover Defender 110 ready for our bolt-in conversion kit. I think the only one missing in the workshop is up at the paint shop at the moment, the VW Synchro, which you might have seen from previous episodes, is getting a very special paint job. So when that's back, I can't wait to try that one. That's going to be quite special. So I think that's it, really. We've covered all the cars uh, in the workshop. My, my favourite was the Porsche 356. What was your favourite, Tim? Oh, mine's definitely the 911, 912. The 912? Yeah, great, great colour, fantastic condition. I can see you in a Porsche yeah, 912. Yeah, I, I need one of those in my life. It's about time you got rid of that Lois and went a bit German and got Porsche, mate. So there you go. I'm getting a funny look off him there. So there we go. Question to you guys out there. What was your favourite car today in the workshop and why? So on that note, hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you on the next one.